Good morning, church. Good morning, church. There's no one like Jesus. Amen? There's no one like Jesus. We serve a God who died on the cross and came back to life. You cannot find that anywhere else but through Jesus. Amen? So won't you greet the person today and tell them how wonderful Jesus is and that there's no one like him. As we get to work. Comes 
Show you power, God. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing.
Conquer the great God. We bow our hearts, we lift our hands, we turn our eyes to again. We surrender to the truth. Oh, yeah. 
are just overwhelmed by the incredible, incredibleness, the, the hugeness, the boundaryless of your love. More and more, Father, we, we come to to an understanding, and yet we cannot understand because your love is just so beautiful, so great, so amazing. And all we can do is we, we can offer to you our heart, our words of adoration, our, our, our time to just say, Lord, we worship you. Because you alone are worthy. You alone are the beginning and the end. You alone are our creator. You alone are the one who holds us in the palm of your hand. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us into your presence. Good worship. Yeah. Thanks, guys and ladies. We're going to turn our attention to the screens as we watch the announcements. I want to welcome all those who are watching, joining us online and they're watching us on Facebook at the moment. Uh, and it's just so good to be in God's presence this morning. Right? Wasn't that an awesome time in worship? I'm still enjoying it. Uh, so we're going to turn to to the Word now and we uh, this morning what we're going to be doing is we're going to be considering part one of the implications of, of the new commandment as we find in John's letter. And so I, I want to encourage you, take the time during the week, read John's letters, one, two, and three. Read through them, think about how they apply to you directly. Uh, and so as we start our sermon, uh, I, I want to start with this. It's election time. Right? None of us know about this, isn't that true? Uh, uh, and what we've been hearing is we've been hearing all the different political parties. We've been hearing them launch their manifesto. We've been hearing them uh, preparing for the November uh, elections that are coming as they publish what their values, their goals, and their promises are so that they can gain more power 
and more votes and maybe even some more money. You know, the one thing that sort of surprises me is I haven't heard one of them say um, we, why we didn't meet the promises we made last time. But no, I won't go there. Won't go there. Uh, we also know, however, because it's politics and it's our experience that the promises made during electioneering seems to be very quickly and very conveniently forgotten. There's one other thing that they seem to forget as well, and that's the role of a politician who is there to serve us. Yeah? So, uh, yes, no. Uh, please understand this is not my personal rant against party politics. Uh, Instead, as I was looking at John's first letter, one of the things I, I discovered is that it was written to the church to guide the church back to their original Christian values, goals, and promises. In other words, it was our Christian manifesto. And so I'm going to keep on coming back to the Christian manifesto as we work through this morning. Because... What had happened in the churches at the time was some of them thought that Christianity needed to be improved. It needed to be made more acceptable or more modern in their thought, in their worldview, in their behavior. Doesn't that sound a bit familiar? Mm -hmm. But what they really wanted was they wanted to a, a free pass that said, as Christians, we, ha we do not have to behave any differently to the world. Yeah. There was one author that I read who described the behavior of that Christian church as such. It said they behaved so poorly, they had become a caricature of Christianity. Now, if you don't know what a caricature, a caricature is, let me tell you. It's a comical exaggeration by means of ridiculous distortion right, of parts or characteristics of someone or something. Now, in portraits of individuals, as you see here, uh, it's often their ears, their chin, their nose, their teeth that are distorted. And just in case you thought that that was a distortion of my hair, no. I really did have hair then. <laughs> yeah. You see, those church members who John was writing to had conveniently forgotten that Christians are called to be holy just as God is holy, says 1 Peter 1 verse 16. And what that meant was, as Christians... They were to be different when compared to the world around them. So much so that they were like a light shining in the darkness, says Matthew 5, 14 and 2, 16. Oh, it's got very quiet here. You know what's coming, don't you? You see, today, the way Christians talk, the way we behave, the actions we do, the attitudes we have outside of church often provides a very distorted view of Christianity. It's this distortion of the truth that John addresses in his first letter so that we would know how to live an authentic, a public, a very visible Christian life. In other words, our Christian manifesto. So let's turn and, and read what John says in the scriptures. And this morning we're going to be focused on verses 7 to 11. Uh, and I'm really going to zoom in on verses 7 and 8 only today. So, from verse 7. Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one. 
one you have heard from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before, yet it is also new. <clears throat> Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you are also living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims, I am living in the light, but hates a brother or sister, <coughs> excuse me, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. These verses introduce us to an implication of the, in the, of the new commandment, an implication of the new commandment. And it's found in verse 7. And when this is lived out, it ensures that we know, that we know both intellectually and experientially that we are loved. Because we experience love with one another and we know that God loves us. You see, this is an instruction for us to live in community, to live a shared life together. Now God's plan for us since creation is for us to love one another. And so it's a challenge for each one of us to decide, to make that choice, to put our minds to it, to take the attitude of consistently and stubbornly loving other people. You see, some people are not easy to love. And I know there's none of us like that in this building today. Right? I know that. Uh, but some people are not easy to love. But you know, we can choose to love them. In the same way that Jesus chose to love you enough that he died for you, we can also choose to love others. So, please understand, this isn't a love that simply accepts any type of behavior. This is not a love that, uh, th instead, this is a love that really wants to see a person, every person, become who God created them to be. That they would achieve all the potential, the God-given potential in them whether it be as a worshiper, uh, to be an active, empowered, equipped follower of Jesus, very different from their peers in the world around them. To such an extent that people see Jesus in them and sometimes no words need ever be said. It's also a love that challenges wrong thinking. It's a love that confronts poor decision making. Uh, it's a love that applies the absolute truth of God's word in relationships. And yet it does this in a gentle, patient, and caring way. See, it doesn't tolerate bad behavior. Instead, it seeks the best for everyone. It's a love that motivates us to be warmly welcoming to everyone, but at the same time still will not condone any behavior that distorts God's values. The sacrificial love of Jesus the love that we are commanded to show when 
when we, are, when we read the scripture that says, love one another, that sacrificial love chooses to place the needs of other people before our own desires, our own plans, and our own goals. Because that's an aspect of the manifesto that Jesus has given us. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's read what Jesus says in John chapter 13 from verse 34 where he says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Then he says, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. That's a challenge. Your love for one another will prove to the world you are my disciples. And notice he didn't say your speech or your ability to argue the point or your Bible knowledge. says, your love for one another. Our relationship with other people demonstrates how true our Christianity is. Because it's either filled with peace and joy and kindness and patience with each other, or it's a display of fighting, of harsh, of hurtful words. It's a, a, a lifestyle that shows selfishness. It shows a me-first attitude in all our actions and behavior. Because love demands that we should be asking of ourselves, how well am I doing on this? And in preparing for this this morning, the one thing that I realized is I've been thinking with all the COVID stuff going around as well. Uh, it's got me thinking in this way. It's me first. Uh, it's keep me protected first. Now, my God has been reminding me that uh, while I'm thinking of the needs of others and while I'm meeting the needs of other people, I can still keep safe. Did you notice it's a, it's a slightly different attitude? It's a slightly different response. It's a slightly different way of thinking where I put the needs of others before I put my own. Let's read that first verse that we read this morning again. I'm not writing a new commandment to you. Rather, it is an old one, one that you've had from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before. See, what John is saying is there's nothing new in what he's sharing. This was an important statement to the church at the time because false teachers were going around saying that they brought a new revelation, a new understanding uh, of Christianity to the church, a more improved version. Now, come on, haven't we heard that one before? John instead reminds everyone that this is the same instruction that Jesus gave when he was asked, what is the most important commandment? And in Matthew chapter 22, he says this, Love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there is a second one, and it's set right alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. We have two hands. Love God, love others. And they are equal. God first, others as well as you love yourself. This is what Jesus instructs everyone who follows him to do. And those early Christians would have learned this truth and learned how to apply it from the example of the existing church members. You know that 
that's a test for us as well. Because our thought should immediately should be, how well am I doing this? This is the foundation of authentic and visible and public Christian behavior. Behavior that is noticeably different when compared to the currently accepted attitudes and understandings and behavior in the world. It stands out like a light in the darkness. But then in verse 8, John says, uh, it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment. You are also living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. This is what he means uh, by saying it is new. Because for everyone who accepts Jesus as Savior, you have already started to live a new life. It's different to what it was before. It's different to how other people are living theirs. Or perhaps I should say it should be different. That's the test that we face when we read these scriptures. Has your lifestyle radically changed since accepting Jesus? If there's been no visible changes, then please, don't leave today without taking some time, talking to myself, talking to one of the prayer ministers, one of the pastoral staff, uh, straight after our last song this morning. But this is the new part of the commandment. Uh, it is living radically different to our old life. It's our new life. Because in the same way that Jesus was very different to his contemporaries, to those around him, so too our new life already begins to reflect this difference in our attitudes, in our behavior, in the way we re begin to respect other people more, in the way we treat them. I can say that. Why? Because the scripture said it in verse 8. Did you notice the tenses that were in verse 8? You are also living it. The true light is already shining out of you. Right? In other words, it has already began. It's Holy Spirit who is in us, uh, who guides us, who encourages us who, to live as Jesus designed us and envisaged for us. And we are already empowered and equipped to love one another. We have it in us. We've started. And now's the time to make the choice to go radical with it. Because we can and we should love just as Jesus did, sacrificially. Seeing a need and then doing everything we can to meet that need. Of course, the question is, will this cost us? Of course it does. Love costs. It costs God the life of his son. It costs Jesus his life. And so it may mean that on occasion, right, we may have to go out of our way to go and fetch people or drop people off. It may mean that we have to be patient and help other people, even though we've got other plans for our, our day. It may mean that we have to put aside sitting and watching sport all afternoon uh, on a Saturday instead of going to go and visit someone and spending time with them. It may also mean that we have to put aside family time so that we can sacrificially love another person. So it does cost us. But when it seems that the cost is getting too much, 
And then I ask myself this question. Have I given my life yet? And I listen and I can hear, feel a heartbeat. I can hear my breathing. And I say, no, I'm still alive. Well, good, because then I can love more. Because love is serving and giving just like Jesus did. He came to serve others. He gave everything he had in serving and in loving. And so this should be our goal. This should be our value. That we are more like Jesus today than we were yesterday in our serving, in our giving, and in our loving of others. This is our manifesto. So how do we love others? And you see, really loving others is a practical, visible action that we take. Loving others is always more than just saying the words. Paul describes this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, where he says, Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Rather be humble, thinking of yourselves as better, think, sorry, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. As we can see, this may require us to adjust our attitudes. So we move away from our current fear-driven, self-centered lifestyle to one that places a higher priority on caring for others. And the most effective way we can do this, we find in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. You have been called to live in freedom, freedom from fear, freedom to love others, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. And we serve by doing something practical for other people. You know, the folk who are part of the worship team, they serve us. Right. The fo everybody who helps out at the registration table are serving. Those who are looking after the children in children's ministry, they're serving. There are many other ways to serve. Outside of, church <coughs> outside of these church meetings, we can also serve. And we can serve by doing sudden and random acts of kindness. Right. One of the things I love doing is when the refuge truck comes down our street, they seem to uh, collect all the bins halfway up the street or halfway down the street. So why not wheel them to the correct house? People don't have to know who does it. Jesus sees it. And you know, the most amazing thing has happened, I've noticed now, that other people in our street have started to do the same thing. Yes. Right. Or, or what about finding so, a, a family who you know, you can see they're under pressure, they're, they're not coping too well at this time, and being a blessing to them, however you can. It may mean cooking a meal and taking a meal to them. Be creative, because God has created us to be creative. Be creative, be helpful, show love. That's who we are. That's who God has created, created us to be. Because as we serve in love, we are fulfilling our manifesto. These are the values, the goals, the promises of Christian love in action. And the implication, the first implication of the new commandment is to love one another with visible actions. But who should I serve? In 
Matthew 25, verse 40, in the second half, Jesus says, Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Who do I serve? I serve. I look out for those who are overlooked. Look out for, for those who are often ignored. Look out for those who people tend to make a fool of them. They ridicule them in the office. And give them respect. Recognize them. Listen to them. Because you'll be amazed at the results. Uh, a number of years ago, I, I worked with a young man who was very prone to making mistakes. And, of course, the, he made the mistake uh, of really angering the, um, uh, the director of our company. Uh, and the director was so incensed with this young man that he picked him up by the scruff of the neck and walked him to the front door of the company and he threw him out. Right? Now, I, I had a team that was off-site that uh, needed somebody and so I, I took this young man on my team and, and I listened to him. I listened to his ideas. I, I gave him the respect and encouragement that he needed. And within, a number of, within about two years, he became month after month, consistently, the employee of the month within the company. See, it just takes a little bit. But everything we do for other people, we do to Jesus. And one another part of the new commandment points to those seated around you, those in our church family. So look around. Check out the people next to you. Come on, look around. Check them out. All right. Now, hopefully you didn't say, I don't like what they wear. Really. But uh, ask yourself this. How am I serving them? Is your honest answer, I'm not serving yet? Well, if it is, please speak to me. Speak to one of the pastoral staff who will be available after the last song. We'll assist. We'll find you a place where you can fit and serve others. Right? So, so let's bring this to a close. The implications of the new commandment uh, that, that it really has for us is to make sure that we understand and we know that we love one another. We make that decision to love one another because when we love authentically in the same way that Jesus did, then we are not creating a visible, a public displayed caric caricature of Christianity. We are displaying true Christianity. Because love itself is visibly, practically serving and giving to other people. And when we serve others in love, what we are doing is we are serving Jesus himself. Because this is our Christian manifesto. These are our values and our goals that we hold on to. These are the promises that we make. And we live them out. As we do that, we will be the people whom God created us to be. More like Jesus tomorrow than we are today. Amen. There will be people here ready to pray for anyone who needs prayer directly after this last song. And I want to encourage you that if Jesus is not yet your Savior. If you are not absolutely certain of it, if your life doesn't show a radical difference today to what it was like before you accepted Jesus, please make sure you do not leave today before you have spoken to myself, one of the pastoral staff, one of the prayer team that are in front here ready to serve you. We're going to stand now. We're going to sing the song. And straight afterwards, if you are ill, 
We know that God can bring healing if you're not feeling well. We know that God can bring healing if you know someone uh, who's not well. We know God can bring healing. Come to the front, ask someone to pray with you. So let's stand as we sing the final song. Yeah. 